I would like to welcome everybody to our transatlantic roundtable to launch the Oxford Handbook of Gender, War and the Western World since 1600, which is at the same time a memorial for our dear friend and colleague Sonia Rose, who was Professor Emerita and former Natalie Salmon Davis Collegiate Professor of History, Sociology and Women's Studies at the University of Michigan and Arbor, and one of the three editors of the handbook. She very sadly died on October 15, 2020, two weeks before Oxford University Press published the handbook. My handbook co-editor, Stefan Duding, Associate Professor at the Center for Gender and Diversity Studies of Redbound University, Nijmegen, and I agreed that launching the handbook and remembering Sonia Rose will have to go hand in hand. My name is Karen Hagemann, and I am the James G. Cannon Distinguished Professor of History at, and a young professor of the Curriculum in Peace, War and Defense at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Stefan Duding and I organized this event together with four of the five main institutions that supported the work on the handbook in wonderful ways by financing seminar and workshop series, conferences and editors meetings on the subject as well as awarding fellowships that provided time for the work on the handbook. These four co-convening institutions include in alphabetical order, the American Academy University in Nijmegen and the University of North Carolina in, uh, at Chapel Hill. In addition, the work on the handbook was supported by the German Historical Institute at Washington DC. Many thanks to all of them for their very generous support. In a few moments, first Barrett Ebert, Vice President of Programs of the American Academy Berlin, and then Jan Willem Duvenberg, Director of, ne of the Netherlands Institute for Advanced Studies Amsterdam, will welcome you. And after this welcome, Susan Graysel, Professor in the Department of History at Ute State University, will speak about Sonia Rose as a transatlantic gender historian. Susan was mentored by Sonia Rose and is one of the 28 authors of the handbook, a team from three continents and six countries. Afterward, I will briefly introduce the handbook and our agenda as editors, and then the round table on gender war and citizenship will follow. I will introduce our aims and the participants of the round table at its beginnings. Before I pass over the microphone to Barrett Ebert, I would like to thank Max Lazar graduate student at the UNC Department of History for his support with the Zoom technology. Thank you very much, everybody, for joining us. I hope we will have two interesting hours. And now I pass the mic over. Thank you so much, Karen, and a very warm welcome to everybody, also from the American Academy. We're extremely honored um, and delighted uh, to be part of the seminar. And um, this is, of course, for various reasons. First and foremost, we're launching the publication of a not so handy handbook um, that was very, very long overdue. And overdue, I don't mean in the sense of, oh God, the authors finally got their work done. Um, overdue, I truly mean in the sense of this is so substantive work uh, on a topic that was truly, truly needed. Um, this most comprehensive historical overview consists of 31 essays in which the authors investigate the interplay of the social construction of gender and the shaping of warfare on, uh, as well as military culture. And this is actually a field that has been predominantly focused on and researched um, with a focus on, on as men, as historical agents, disregarding gender and its interrelations with war and the military. So we are especially and truly, truly grateful to the three editors who made this happen. And Karen has said it before, um, this seminar is also a way to remember Sonia Rose, who sadly died uh, weeks before the publication of the book. And uh, we are very, very happy and delighted um, that her daughter is with us uh, in the audience tonight, uh, tonight, today, this morning, <laughs> wherever we, we, we are um, in this world. Um, I'm very delighted to welcome the two other editors as well as four of the authors of this very important publication. Um, welcome to you, Karen. 
Stefan, Kimberly, Richard, Susan, and Thomas. All of you are leading international scholars whose expertise cover a wide range of disciplines and whose perspectives truly transcend borders. And we really, really appreciate that. Um, you will be introduced in detail by Karen, but this is why I will focus a little bit on Karen and also because Karen was a fellow at the American Academy. Um, Karen already said where she's working and she has of course published widely on military history and women's and gender history from the late 18th to the late 20th century. Most recently in 2019, her newest German monograph also came out. Um, and it is entitled Umkämpftes Gedächtnis, die Antinapoleonischen Kriege in der Deutschen Erinnerung and came out with Schöning as part of the series Die Revolutions- und Napoleonischen Kriege in Europäischer Erinnerung. Her most recent book is, of course, our handbook of today. And this was combined with a digital humanities initiative in 2014 that Karen will be certainly talking about later. Um, the beginnings of this work um, for Karen, I guess, started partly at the American Academy when she was a fellow in 2015. Karen, Karen we miss you every day and um, hope that you will be back. Um, um, when she left the American Academy, Karen went on to NIAS to continue her work. I will do the same. Uh, don't worry, Jan, I will not <laughs> come and visit you, but I will pass the word on to you now. Um, so Jan is the director of NIAS. Um, and Jan, thank you for the cooperation. Thank you for broadening the American Academy's horizon to include um, our Dutch friends and everyone who is in the audience um, after you will have listened um, to this conversation. You have one homework to do and this is by the book. Thank you. Over to you, Jan. Thanks, uh, Berit, for the kind words. Welcome to all of you from NIAS. I'm the director of NIAS, the Netherlands Institute for Humanities and Social Science. And um, actually, as a director of NICE, I'm very proud and happy that we can co-organize this event. It's wonderful to see the handbook out. And um, yeah, NIA has only played a small role in providing facilities and, of course, also in offering a fellowship uh, to Karen. Um, it's an important book, but I don't have to convince those who are present today of that. But indeed, a handbook published by Oxford University Press is a recognition of the field as an established field. And that is important to acknowledge, I think. And perhaps now it looks almost self-evident that we have always been in need of such a handbook, right? But that always feels like that when the handbook or when a book is published. But it is thanks to the hard work of Karen Hageman, Stefan Doering, and the late Sonia Rose that it actually materialized. So congratulations to the three of you, the editors, but also, of course, to all contributors. A gender perspective, it has already been said, uh, ha has not always been self-evident in the study of war or citizenship, to put it mildly. A gender perspective is recent and it is vulnerable. Uh, I became, or I realized that again, uh, NIAS is celebrating its 50th anniversary this year, so we are looking backward. We are working on publications about 50 years of NIAS. And I have to admit that in that perspective, we have quite a troubling past. We have had rather few female uh, fellows and uh, in the, over the 50 past years, little attention for gender topics. But luckily enough, that has radically changed. And it might sound a little bit self-congratulatory, but just to acknowledge that there has been po positive change uh, in the past uh, years. But that is not true everywhere. And for how long is that true? Look at the backlash in Poland, look at the backlash in Hungary, and now even in France. I don't know how to evaluate the Netherlands in that perspective. It looks slightly brighter here, I would say, and that is indeed thanks to institutes such as the Gender and Diversity Studies Institute at Radboud University in Nijmegen as one of the strongholds uh, of uh, a gender perspective in the Netherlands and already for so many decades. So let me use this occasion to thank in particular Stefan Duding for his work over the years at that institute where he has played a major role. 
let me stop there and wish you a very good seminar. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Barrett and Jan Willem, for this very kind words of welcome. It was a great pleasure for us, for Stefan, Sonja and me to work together at your institutions. And I cannot uh, underline enough how crucial this time which we had together, the meetings, the good dinners, the wine, the conversations, the walks, which we had together. Yeah. This brings me to the sad, the very sad part that we lost Sonia Rose before the handbook came out, that we lost her period. I really, I'm still very sad and moved by it because I think we lost a very good friend. Not only a colleague and an excellent internationally well-known scholar. And we therefore asked uh, one of the authors of the handbook who knows Sonia very well for a long time to talk a little bit before we take up one of the subjects Sonia cared a lot about, and that is gender, war, and citizenship next to other subjects in our round table. Sonia uh, was really a brilliant scholar, as we will hear, and before Susan talks about it, I will introduce her a little bit more. Susan Grasel is a professor of history at Utah State University, and her research focuses on 20th century British, French, and European history with a special focus on the history of war and society, especially gender, women, and war. Her most recent two books, monographs, are At Home, Under Fire, Air Raids and Culture in Britain, From the Great War to the Blitz, published in 2012, and then the edited volume Gender and the Great War that came out in 2017, which she added together with Tammy Proctor. Susan, please. So it's a thank you for the introduction. Um, it's a privilege to be here today um, with my colleagues honoring Sonia Rose. Uh, I know I speak for many of us here when I say that what will keep her memory alive is not just her inspirational research, but more important, her generosity as a friend, as a scholar, as a mentor. There are some historians that you admire from afar or for whom reading the work alone suffices. It's impossible to separate the impact of Sonia's work from her humanity her willingness to support her students, colleagues, and peers, and her ability to offer a model for how to live an engaged intellectual life that made time for family, for deep friendship, and for the commitment to bettering the world. I'm gonna to try to speak about Sonia without becoming emotional and to focus on her public legacies, but I think she might forgive me for noting that along with many others, some of whom are probably in this room, I wouldn't have been able to have a place in the academy without her. I simply can't imagine what might have happened if she hadn't taken me under her wing when I arrived in Michigan as a newly minted PhD, working as an adjunct. I wasn't her student. I hadn't published anything. I was trying to figure out a way to be a scholar of gender and war. And she did what she does so well, did so well. She listened, encouraged, and offered truly stellar advice from the moment that I met her in 1995 into the last letters of reference that she wrote for me a few years ago. As I speak, I have Sonia beside me with her incredible smile and also a link to her memorial website. Anyone who wants to share their own gratitude and memories is welcome on behalf of her family, especially her daughter, Laura, who I'm so honored is here tonight. Um, and you're really encouraged to post them there. In my brief time today, I want to highlight what made Sonia's scholarship so unique and so vital to so many of us who traverse the transatlantic divide. We North American-based historians whose scholarly life has focused on the United Kingdom in particular, who are informed by theoretical and methodological influences from two distinct academic cultures, and especially those of us who study class, empire, gender, war, we owe a debt to Sonia's work. She and her scholarship remarkably lies at the heart of all of this. Born in New York and raised there and in Ohio, Sonia attended Antioch College before earning her M a and a PhD in sociology at Northwestern. This background in sociology emerges powerfully in all of her work and her attentiveness to the interplay of categories of identity and the state. It informs the wonderful capaciousness and ambition of her original work on class, labor, gender, and citizenship, and her later contributions to our understanding of empire and war. After spending the first part of her academic career at Colby College in Maine, she joined the faculty at the University of Michigan 
as professor of history, sociology, and women's studies. In addition to being a core member of the Department of History, she eventually became its beloved chair. Upon retirement, she took her academic life and herself and continued her work as a scholar and mentor by moving across the Atlantic to London, becoming a visiting researcher at Birkbeck College. Countless of us, countless of us based elsewhere found our research trips there. Um, they went smoother after a stimulating meal or coffee in her company. Her deep connections with both British and American academia are readily apparent in her engagement with scholarship from both sides of the Atlantic and the growing community of those committed to transforming the history of Britain from the study of England into the study of Britain's four nations and far-flung empire. Her 1992 monograph, Limited Livelihoods, Gender and Class in 19th Century England, offers an exemplary model of how concepts of gender transform the study of women workers and working class life itself. And as scholars like Dennis Dworkin observe, it also reflected her capacity to move back and forth with enviable ease between theoretical discussions and primary sources. Her work forms part of a set of study by transatlantic feminist scholars of Britain in that era, whose critique of British social history, especially the pioneering work of E.P. Thompson, led to challenging models of class struggle that ignored the central role of women and of gender. Suna's contribution in this realm, in her own words, was offering a path for all interested in a nuanced version of labor history. And I quote, the way forward in scholarship on class is to creatively combine critical Marxian historical analysis, postmodern sensibilities, and keen attention to issues of race, gender, and ethnicities to produce various forms of resistance and contestation and discourse. Hopefully the result would be an amalgamum that would synergistically produce new historical insights. That call for new ways of seeing core aspects of the past resonates from its publication in 1998 of that essay, Resuscitating Class, uh, to this day. That same attentiveness to race, gender, and ethnicity, as well as class and the state, informs her brilliant second monograph. Unlike historians who focus on one particular era, Sonia shifted centuries from the 19th to the 20th and engaged with another dense historiography, that of Britain during the Second World War in her 2003 study of national identity and citizenship, which peoples wore. This pathbreaking book illuminates in her words, again, I quote her, the numerous possibilities for transformation unleashed by and through the processes of national identity formation and the construction of the meaning of wartime citizenship. The trajectory of this volume takes us from the significance of class to that of gender with influential discussions of masculinity as well as femininity, to how citizenship intertwined with race, to exploring notions of the moral or good citizen and the internal enemy, as well as investigating the status of Scotland and Wales and the empire within the larger discourse of Britain's people's war and finest hour. Any one of these topics could constitute its own volume. And that Sonia's research opens up fields and invites further inquiry is evident throughout this book. Again, as both part of and an inspiration to a group of transatlantic scholars who'd begun to insist on the centrality of gender and class, to insist that we think about the imperial and racial dimensions of Britain World War, Britain's world wars, uh, Sonia's work stands out. As my colleague um, and one of her students, Alison Abra, summarizes so well, it illuminates how discussions centered on national unity, social leveling, and equality of sacrifice powerfully shaped ideas about duty, citizenship, and national identity, even as the war produced new fissures of gender, class, race, and region within the national community. Her 2006 co-edited collection with Catherine Hall at Home with the Empire followed, demonstrating the inseparability of metropole and empire in shaping modern British identity. But her attention to neglected areas of research on gender and war also continued. In her 2014 essay on the politics of sacrifice, she shifted her attention to yet another dense historiography to the First World War, investigating discourses of sacrifice in wartime culture that placed Indian troops and Irish troops at the center. As if this wouldn't be enough, she also in 2010 distilled the entire field of gender history in an essential volume for the policy series, What is History? 
by synthesizing major theoretical models and essential case studies, she produced what is gender history. Looking at it recently, I wonder who could update it. It's hard to imagine who else possessed, um, possesses her vast knowledge and curiosity about historical topics far afield from her own. Her willingness to engage with cutting edge research to produce an introduction for students that not only informs them about, but again also invites them as fellow travelers to embark on the study of gender history. Concise, lucid, but also marked with her generosity and belief in the power of history to propel change. When Philippa Levine and I had the opportunity to edit a fest trip for Sonia in 2009, we came up with what we thought was a working title, Gender, Labor, War and Empire, Essays in Modern Britain. It is one of the highlights of my academic life to work with, have worked with Sonia's transatlantic students and colleagues and admirers to bring that to light. And try as we might to find a catcher title, in the end, we decided to let it stand. Lately, and especially since her loss, I've been thinking that maybe we should have just called it Essays on Modern Britain, because thanks in no small measure to Sonia, historians and students and both sides of the Atlantic have come to see how we cannot study this history without attention to the intertwining of all of these components. Sonia left a profound impact on the study of modern Britain, but as her final contribution to our collective knowledge, her editorship and editorial work on the Oxford Handbook on Gender, War, and the Western World since 1600 leaves us still with her wisdom on war, gender, race, and citizenship, topics that we're about to have illuminated by my wonderful colleagues in a moment. This is an occasion for celebration, but it is truly bittersweet to see the handbook arrive without having Sonia here to celebrate. As much as she left us the gift of her scholarship that will continue to shape this field, she left a legacy for my generation, for her students, for her mentees, and those that follow on both sides of the Atlantic. With Sonia as our guiding light, we can strive to be the person in the room who, like her, always asked how we were, not just how the work was going, whose focus on the past never obscured her commitment to political engagement and the fight for justice and equity in the present, whose fully lived life resonated with music and good food and joy, as well as books. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Susan Grazel, for this very kind, very warm, very heartfelt words. Um, now we have to move a little bit forward. And I think Sonia would have said, let's do it, you know, in her way. And I must say, I now want to talk a little bit about the handbook and the conceptual ideas behind it. From the very beginning, this would not have been possible, this whole handbook with Alessandra. And I'm still, and I think, uh, Stefan, you will remember it too, our very first meeting in the British Library for three days, you know, between, you know, all the books where we envisioned the concept of the handbook and had a lot of good food and a lot of coffee and really, really good time. And it was so much fun to work with her. So uh, very often we talk about our work as work, but it is really a pleasure to really work with people who are brilliant and ex share with you, you know, the exploration of ideas and really allow you to give you the space, as you said, to develop ideas, you know, and develop them colloquially. And that's what Sonia did for the handbook. We tried to push Oxford University Press to bring it out earlier, you know, because we knew about her sickness, but unfortunately uh, this didn't work out. So uh, with, I will now talk briefly about the ideas which Sonia, Stefan and I really shared in the development of the handbook. To date, the history of military and war has focused predominantly on men as ungendered historical agents, still disregarding gender and its complex interrelationship with war and the military, despite an increasing amount of research on gender, military and war since the 1980s. 
When I was invited by Oxford University Press to do a handbook on gender and war, I was, after quite some hesitation, in the end delighted because this seems to be a great opportunity to showcase the development and state of the research and critically engage with it. I asked Stefan Tuding and Sonia Rose to join me as co-editors because I knew them and their excellent work for a long time and felt that we would work very well together, which we indeed did. When we started to think about the outline of the Oxford Handbook of Gender War and the Western World since 1600, eight years ago, we agreed from the beginning that we wanted to have a handbook with a shared set of questions and themes, a joint approach and comparative and transnational chapters that challenge historical master narratives including the powerful construction of a so-called general or universal in history that de facto only embodies white men. Instead, we aim for an approach that emphasizes the non-unity of history and embraces its multiplicity. We agreed that the handbook should pose two central questions. First, how has gender been shaped by war and the military and simultaneously helped to shape them? And second, how did the relation between war and the military on the one hand and gender on the other over time changed in different regions? These two questions are explored in 32 essays by specialists in the history of military and war and experts in gender and women's studies. Drawing from the disciplines of history, cultural studies, political science, and international relations. The group met for two conferences and workshops, and then the editors for several additional editors' workshops. The development of the study of gender, the military, and war since the 1980s informed the approach of our handbook and our understanding of its three key concepts gender, war, and violence, which all three have to be historicized and understood as relational analytical concepts that only work in intersection. Research on the history of the military and war requires an understanding of gender as knowledge about sexual difference produced by culture and society and knowledge that is not only always produced in complex ways in specific historical discursive contexts, but is also relative. Therefore, gender operates only in intersection with other categories of difference, such as class, race, ethnicity, age, sexuality, in a manner that orders the world asymmetrically and hierarchically, which cannot be separated from its political, economic, and social organization. In contrast to many works by feminist scholars that focus on women, the military and war, the handbook emphatically takes gender to refer to those men and women, along with the related constructions of femininity and masculinity. In doing so, it avoids the implicit assumption <clears throat> guiding much of the existing literature that only women's relation to the military and war requires explanation, a way of thinking that regards men's place in the military and war as somehow self-evident and not in need of explanation. Our approach emphasizes the historical specificity and relatedness, not only of gender, but also of military war and violence and calls for, its critical evaluation, calls for a critical evaluation of these concepts too. From the perspective of gender history, every schematic conceptualization of these three terms is problematic. Despite certain continuities, the form and context of military, war, and violence are in constant flux, requiring us to historicize and contextualize them as deliberately as we do the concept of gender. The state of research on gender and war framed the temporal and regional handbook too. Because of the small number of studies on the Asian and medieval periods, we decided to start in the 17th century with the Thirty Years' War and its long-term aftermath and in end in the first decade of the 21st century with the wars of globalization. The handbook is organized chronologically in four parts. 
The first part covers the 17th and 18th century, the second, the 19th century, the third, the first half of the 20th century, and the fourth, the second half of the 20th century. Of course, the boundaries between these four parts are fluid. Long-term developments are addressed throughout. Several thematic chapters thus cross time periods, which we employ mainly as starting points for explorations of transformations in gender and the modes of warfare over time. This helps us to bring into, variable, bring into view variable and changing ways of organizing and waging war with an emphasis on the mutually constitutive elements with gender. With this approach, we do not intend to present the military war as prime motors of historical change. We do, however, believe that the chronological structure of the handbook provides a good starting point for the aim for exploration of continuities and changes in the relation of military war and gender. While the temporal scope of the handbook is limited to the periods referred to as early modern and modern, we do not assume a given singular nature of modernity or its unidirectional rise, quite the contrary. We question these assumptions from the perspective of a gender history of war. In a similar way, the handbook engaged with recent developments, developments in colonial and global history in order to move beyond the nation state and the West as the seemingly self-evident frameworks for the writing of history. We attempt to provincialize Europe and the Americas by approaching the histories as particular histories, among others. The Western world is treated in the handbook as both a changing and contested construct and as a historical phenomenon which was transformed through colonial and imperial expansion. We also do not see warfare in the Western world as a universal model or belief in the idea of larger, allegedly coherent civilizational ways of war. As a result, we do not only cover the development in Europe and the Americas, but also the long-term processes of colonization and empire building originating in early modern Europe and their aftermath in, Amer in the Americas, in Asia, Africa, and Australia. To be able to realize this agenda, we decided early on to exclude chapters that focus on specific countries. Instead, we identified five historical processes that provided a framework for the analysis of regional and temporal developments, changes in the form and technology of warfare, and specific types of war state formation and nation building, colonialism and imperialism, national liberation and anti-colonialism, anti and the promulgation of war and violence and attempts to control and prevent them. The gendered analysis of these five historical processes set the stage for the study of the ways in which gender and war have mutually shaped each other, for which we identified six themes, themes as central in all four centuries covered gender representations of the military and war, gendered war mobilization and war support by society, gendered experiences on the battles and so-called battle and home fronts, gender war and sexual violence, gender military service and citizenship, and gender demobilization, post-war societies and war memories. The organization of the handbook reflects this agenda. Each of the four parts opened with a long overview chapter by the editors. Afterward, each part continues with five to 10 thematic essays with varying, varying thematic, geographical, and temporal focus. As a supplement to the selected bibliographies of each chapter, a much more extensive bibliography for each chapter can be found on the website Gender and War Online, a digital humanities project related to this handbook based at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and developed by a team of graduate and undergraduate students in cooperation with UNCIT research under my leadership. That currently includes more than 9,000 annotated bibliographical information entries 
on secondary literature, autobiographies, websites with primary sources and films on the subject of gender and womb. We hope that taken together, the Oxford Handbook and Give You Online will not only make the extensive research in the field of gender and war available to a broad audience beyond experts in women and gender, women and gender studies, but also will pose a decided challenge to the conventional historiography on military and war with, it, with its continuing gender blindness. Please allow me at the end of this brief introduction of the handbook to thank everybody involved in the work for the handbook, especially our sponsors, all authors, my co-editors, and our excellent editorial assistant, Derek Hallgren. Thank you very much to all of you. And I think we can be really proud that after eight years of work together, everybody in the team is still on friend friendly terms. We are really actually, it was fun to work on this and we enjoyed the ride. So thank you very much. Now it's time to move forward. And uh, I would like to introduce the round on gender, war and citizenship. As you could hear, this is one of the six major themes of the handbook. But not only that, it was also a very important subject of Sonia Rose's research. And that's why we choose this subject as the theme for the handbook launch and memorial today. The round table starts from her suggestion to think citizenship, to think of citizenship as a framework that serves as a basis for claims making. Citizenship, she wrote, is a discursive framework that enables people to make various political and other claims and shames political subjectivities that get enacted in the process of claims making. Deeply marked by race, gender, race, and class, this framework of citizenship produces exclusions and offers tools to contest it, exactly these exclusions. What often comes with a particular intense discourse and politics of citizenship in which claims made by and on people get linked to the issues of national survival. This roundtable will explore the politics of citizenship in the war and ask how transformations of modern warfare have affected notions of citizenship and gender and vice versa how historical changing notions of citizenship and gender shaped military and war. The roundtable participants are in the order of their appearance. Thomas Kühne, director of the Stressler Center for Holocaust and Genocide Studies at Clark University, where he holds the Stressler share in Holocaust history. His research focuses on Nazi perpetrators and bystanders on military cultures and more broadly on the construction of the collective identity through mass, collective identities through mass violence. His most recent monographs include The Rise and Fall of Comradeship, Hitler's Soldiers, Male Bonding and Mass Violence in the 20th Century, published in 2017, and Belonging and Gen Genocide, Hitler's Community, 1918 to 1945, published in 2010. He will explore the three categories of gender, war, and citizenship and suggest some questions for the discussion. Stefan Düring is associate professor at Radboud University Nijmegen, where he teaches gender and sexuality studies. His main field of research is the history of gender and sexuality in modern Western political and military cultures. His most recent book is next to the Oxford Handbook, the edited volume representing masculinity, male citizenship in modern Western culture that came out in 2007. He will talk about masculinity, war and citizenship in 18th and 19th century Europe. Richard Smith is senior lecturer in the Department of Media, Communications and Cultural Studies, Goldsmiths, University of London. He has written widely on the experience of Western Indian troops in both world wars and race and, and the race and gender implications of military service in this context. 
and also in a broader comparative context. His book include the monograph, his books include the monograph Jamaican Volunteers in the First World War Race, Masculinity and the Development of National Consciousness that came out in 2004. He will reflect on colonial soldiers, empire and male citizenship in the age of the world wars. And last but not least, Kimberly Jensen is professor of history and gender studies at Western Oregon University. Her research addresses questions of women, citizenship, and civil liberties in the United States in the period of the First World War and its aftermath, the history of women and medicine and women's transnational activism. Her most recent books are Oregon's Doctors to the World, Esther Paul Lovejoy and Alive in Activism that came out in 2012, and the 2010 edited volume, Women and Transnational Activism, in historical perspective. She will talk about the North American home front, race and citizenship. All panelists were also the handbook. I would like to end here and would like to give Thomas Kühne the microphone. Thank you very much. Thank you, Karen, for this um, wonderful introduction. Thank you for including me in this um, exciting round table and of course for including me in this in the larger book project. It has been and is an honor to be part of all of that. Ladies and gentlemen, war is men's business, not ladies, is what Red Butler says in the 1939 movie Gone with the Wind, one of the most popular movies ever and one of the most effectively perpetuated myth about American slavery, anti-black stereotypes about the Civil War and about war in general. Myth transform history into nature. Roland Barthes famously said, they convert change into eternity, agency into destiny. Red Butler's statement is one of the most powerful of these myths in this case, one that had been invalidated already by the American Civil War, the subject of the movie and Margaret Mitchell's famous book on which the movie was based. The Oxford Handbook of Gender War and, Western, and the Western World since 1600 synthesizes and advances more than 50 years of scholarly falsifications of this myth. It illuminates for the past 400 years that, how, why, and to which consequences. War was never only men's, but always also ladies' business. This is true not only for the era of the so-called total wars in Europe in the first half of the 20th century, but also for the American Civil War and for the colonial wars Europeans waged overseas since the dawn of modernity. My job today, is to introduce you to the topic of our roundtable. I will offer a few remarks on the three key concepts of this roundtable, gender, war, and citizenship, and on the way gender historians and gender scholars have made sense of, but also problematized these categories. I will conclude by addressing a few questions to which the following papers by Stefan, Richard, and Kimberly then will respond. First, the concept of gender. Gender is, to quote Karen Hagemann's introduction to the volume, an amalgam of ideals and practices that give meaning to and socially differentiate male and female. Norms, ideas, and practices addressed as masculine or manly, as feminine or womanly, are not emanations from biological givens. They are socially and culturally constructed. They change over time and they vary between different societies as well as within societies. Gender is a marker of biological sex and social practices, imageries, and ideologies that organize power relations, hierarchies, and identities between and within the sexes. In this spirit, gender scholars have unmasked the myth of men as universal actors and made women visible as historical actors as, for instance, auxiliaries, nurses, partisans, and soldiers in modern wars, 
as targets of air raids, mass rape and genocide, as victims, accomplices and perpetrators of mass violence. Gender scholars have also made visible men as gendered subjects and analyzed how different notions of masculinity and manliness have informed men's choices at different times and in different spaces. This way, gender scholars have not only challenged binary juxtapositions of male warriors and peaceful women, they have also changed, uh, challenged uh, the binary core set of gender ideologies. They have exposed the manifold ways in which notions of masculinity work not only in men, but also in women and vice versa. Notions of femininity are working not only in women, but also in men. Now, gender is a relational category, not only in that it manages relations between men and women and between femininity and masculinity. As a category of social difference, gender works in conjunction with other categories of social differences, including class, race, age, sexuality, religion, ethnicity, and nation. Now, the concepts of war and citizenships. These are no less stable than the concept of gender, and the handbook probes into their fluidity in synchronous and diachronous terms. In a naive fashion, war, our second concept, may be understood as violent conflict between two or more groups of combatants, but probably in no point in history, and certainly not in the history under consideration in this handbook, does such a definition comply with the practice of warfare. Even the so-called cabinet wars of the 19th century in Europe, even in these wars, the lines between combatants and non-combatants were blurred by franc-tireurs or partisans and by their enemies. All sides of warfare blurred these distinctions in order to radicalize their own military violence into fantasies and realities of absolute destruction of the enemy of total mobilization of their own population for the war project and not least the distinction of entire populations as Europeans did first in their colonies and then in the 20th century in Europe itself. Thirdly, the concept of citizenship. For the purpose of our historical inquiries, citizenship is best understood not simply as a legal formula. Instead, it is, to quote Roger Brubaker, a salient social and cultural fact, a powerful instrument of social closure." End of quote. It decides about inclusions and exclusions, about who belongs and who doesn't, and where people are placed in the hierarchy of political and other rights. Citizenship establishes boundaries and identities. While aiming at or claiming for stability, any given citizenship is subject to contest. Class, gender, race, not least age, they all intervene into these contests and often they do so guided by ideas about individuals' social merits, earned, for instance, in war on behalf of the nation. Pointing to the historical volatility of the concepts of gender, war and citizenship, now is not the end, but only the beginning of historical inquiry. In modern times, war and military service have been among the most impactful arenas to negotiate the type of merit that entitles to citizenship. A key question of this round table is how changes of warfare, different types of war, and the place of war and military in modern societies have informed disputes on citizenship and how gender relations have intervened and in and been affected by these disputes. A prominent line of research has pointed to a seemingly constructive or progressive effect of war and even genocide. In the total wars of the first half of the 20th century, Europeans experienced the systematic erasure of boundaries between combatants and non-combatants. Civilian populations, including women, were mobilized for and targeted by war, with genocide as the ultimate consequence. Women's mobilization during the First World War included work as factory workers and nurses. In the Second World War increasingly also as military aides, resistance fighters, and even regular soldiers. 
Thanks to this mobilization, women gained suffrage after the First World War in many European countries. And some historians have argued that this war catalyzed the liberation of women politically as well as socially by expanding women's work opportunities and lives beyond motherhood. Processes like these have uh, did continue, for instance, in Nazi Germany. The exclusion of Jewish women and men from citizenship in Germany went along with a new enlivened sense of belonging to and empowerment of Aryan women in the racist nation, now called Volksgemeinschaft, notwithstanding the fact that both women and men were simultaneously robbed certain political rights. Analyzing how Jews, on the other hand, coped with persecution during the Holocaust in ghettos and camps, historians have also diagnosed a role reversal of men and women during the Holocaust. Nazi persecution robbed Jewish men of their traditional roles as providers and protectors of their families. At the same time, women took over, secured food and shelter for their families, including men, provided mental survival kits, performed roles that had previously been performed by men. But none of these changes lasted long after those wars or genocides, or if so, only partially. In a groundbreaking essay, Margaret and Patrice Higonet introduced in 1987 the metaphor of the double helix to explain this paradoxical progress and regress and the underlying constancy of a gender-linked subordination. Paradoxes of change and continuity have since challenged historians of women's and men's roles, lives, and representations. These historians have paid particular attention to uh, studying the historically volatile interplay of representations and experiences. Often, powerful representations of polar, hierarchical, or patriarchal gender orders proved immune to change. They countered contained or even neutralized short-term changes of objective conditions and subjective experiences of, for instance, female empowerment or liberation. With this agenda in mind, the following three presenters will explore the wartime politics of citizenship in various historical and geographical contexts, ranging from late 18th century wars of revolution and independence to World War II. Three sets of questions are central to their exploration. Number one, how have specific gender orders informed historical wars and types of war? How have vice versa, specific historical wars and types of war shaped gender orders and gendered politics of citizenship in particular? Number two, how have wartime politics of citizenship been shaped by the intersection of categories of difference and inequality such as gender, race, and class. And finally, number three, what were the long-term effects on gender orders of wartime politics of citizenship? What explains the persistence or subsiding of wartime reconfigurations of gender and citizenship? Three big questions. And now I hand over to our next panelist. Okay, thank you very much, Thomas. Um, I would like to start by thanking everybody involved in today's roundtable for uh, being here and thanking the audience for being here, not just in order to mark the publication of this Oxford handbook, but in particular, thanking them for be being here, uh, for remembering Sonia Rose, our wonderful and generous colleague, and honoring uh, her work, which has been so important to the field of study that we're speaking about today. So thank you very much. Um, the specific kind of warfare that I will be speaking about today is modern warfare as it emerged with the French Revolutionary and Napoleonic Wars. Now, there was much about these wars that actually wasn't modern at all. As historian Michael Brewers has pointed out, these wars were waged to a large extent on the basis of early modern technology and tactics um, but there was one crucial change, and that is, as Brewers argued, the scale of these wars and what was entailed in managing this scale. 
Now, to be sure, ancien regime states could also field massive armies in times of war, and they did so, but both in terms of absolute numbers and in terms of the size of armies in relation to population size, these wars of revolution and Napoleonic wars do represent a quantitative leap in the size of armies and battles. A quantitative leap that rested on a new politics of recruitment and mobilization, a new politics of recruitment and mobilization that is of great interest to gender historians and to historians of masculinity. Now, on what gender order did this a quantitative leap in the scale of war rest. It rested, I would argue, paradoxically on a gender orderly order that was partly called into existence by these wars and by these modes of mobilization and recruitment themselves. It rested on the notion that all men should serve as men, that all men should serve, that all men should, could be recruited because they were men. It rested, in other words, on a gender order in which a shared manhood was considered to, more, to be more important than the differences between men, differences in terms of class, religious or regional identities were transcended by this shared manhood. As French historian André Rauch has argued, universal conscription transformed la condition masculine, it transformed the male condition, it homogenized the category man, and it homogenized to a certain extent the experiences of man. And in de-emphasizing the differences between men, it made different, de-emphasizing the differences between men, it made the differences between men and women all the more important. So in this respect, these new politics of recruitment and mobilization represent a crucial moment in the making of the myth that Thomas Kuhn had just referred to, the myth that war is man's business and man's business alone. The wars, the Napoleonic Wars and the French Revolutionary Wars represent an important moment in the process of naturalization that is myth, but they also offer a view of the contributions and the complexities that myth renders invisible. Because at no point in the history of the Revolutionary and Napoleonic Wars did all men serve because they were men. In addition to the relatively obvious grounds for not serving, such as age and ability, class, and as the, age, and as the century progressed, familial status were important grounds for not serving. Wealthy men could continue to pay for replacements, and one's status as a father, husband, brother, brother-in-law, son, or even grandson, as the century progressed, could also protect man against the duty to serve. Sociologist Dorit Geva has therefore argued that not all men were treated as equal, abstract, and universal by the politics of conscription of the French Revolutionary and Napoleonic Wars and the policies that followed them. In addition to this, we need to remind ourselves of the fact that France's opponents in these wars continue to recruit on the basis of ancien regime systems of recruitment that were based on differentiations between men rather than similarities between men, as in, for instance, the ruthless politics of conscription of Russia based on status of servhood. So why then has the myth that all men serve persisted and has been so powerful in the face of so much evidence to the contrary? Why is this myth and has continued to be so powerful? And I would like to point to two reasons for this. First of all, although we cannot think of the 19th century as a century in which the scale of war in a linear way progressed, uh, progressed and extended, it is true that in particular after mid-century, the scale of war, the size of armies began to increase again, supported by the introduction of ever more demanding systems of conscription in various European countries. So to a certain extent, the myth had the tailwind of history in its back, one could say. Second, I would claim that the myth persisted because of its entanglement with another myth, its entanglement with the myth that is important from the revolutionary moment onwards, that because all men serve, they are also deserving of citizenship. The myth that all men, because they serve, are also potentially uh, citizens with full uh, political rights. Already during the French Revolution, however, the categorical equation of men's serving with deserving political rights was a myth too. It was only 
partially realized, and when it was realized, it was so only for a limited moment in time. Nevertheless, this myth too, like the myth that all men fight, that it rests on and that it is entangled with, has proven to be particularly powerful and persistent. And one reason for this, I think, is that it was kept alive by the fact that groups of men who were excluded from political citizenship claimed it on the basis of their ability to serve, their willingness to serve, or their already having served. They made claims to political rights in return for sacrifices made for the state. And they made claims, and so in terms that I, I used earlier in this talk, these men made political claims uh, on the basis of a shared manhood proved by a willingness and ability to fight, a shared manhood that transcended differences on the basis of class, race, or religion. Historian Derek Penslar, in his history of Jews and the military, has argued that prior to the emancipation of women by the very end of the 19th century and continuing into the 20th, the emancipation of any specific group was linked to military service. Now, if he is right, this helps perhaps to explain the persistence of these two entangled myths of all men um, being soldiers and therefore being entitled to the rights of political citizenship. Now, all of this hopefully goes some way towards explaining the persistence of these two myths that are so powerful and persistent, but in particular, given the glaring contradictions between these myths and historical fact, more needs to be said about this. And here we come to the point of future research. And I think that future research would do well to look for guidance in this respect to the work of Sonia Rose, and in particular to her wonderful 2007 essay that perhaps hasn't received as much attention as it should have received, the essay, Fit to Fight but Not to Vote. In that essay, Sonia Rose explored the history of fighting masculinity and citizenship in a way that I think can well serve as a model for future research. First, um, what, what is important about this essay I think, first of all, is that she explored the history of fighting masculinity and citizenship in the context of British history. And of course, British history has long been regarded as a sort of outlier in histories of um, conscription and, um, and recruitment because of a long lasting uh, resistance against standing armies and because of the relatively late introduction of general conscription during World War I. Um, this, I would say, actually makes it a promising context for studying the links between fighting masculinity and citizenship, because when you start to look at these histories from the French Revolution, as I have done in my chapter for the handbook, it is very easy for your own narrative to become overwhelmed by the narrative of the revolutionaries and by the enormous impact that the narrative of the revolutionaries themselves has had on historiography it is very easy to think of the links between fighting masculinity and citizenship as already there, as established, and then being universalized in this blissful moment of transfer to the rest of the world. Uh, when you start this history from British history, for sure there are other risks <laughs> that you then run, but you do not risk the, run the risk of being um, overwhelmed by this history of given links between masculinity, fighting and citizenship and their progressive universalization. That's a risk that you definitely do not run when you start, as Sonia did, uh, writing this history in a British context. Second thing that is important, I think, about this uh, essay and uh, a very useful uh, starting point for future research is that Sonia pointed to the simple but often ignored fact that throughout the 19th century, British common soldiers were denied the vote and that none of the successive reform acts that extended the vote, the vote to wider groups of men changed this. Common soldiers were among the last groups of men to be enfranchised in 1918, despite the fact that they were fit and willing to fight. So what we have there is a history that starts with masculinity, fighting and citizenship, not being connected. And such a history, such a starting point might be very useful for gaining more insight into the process of their becoming connected and constituting in the end, this powerful and persistent myth that Thomas identified um, in his introduction. 
So um, I'm very glad that I can, can point to this uh, uh, essay of Sonia's as a road towards uh, the future. Thank you very much. So thanks very much, Stefan, and, and thanks everybody else uh, for, for participating in uh, today's uh, wonderful event. Uh, as a, a relatively uh, minor player in, in, in terms of the volume itself, uh, contributing the chapter on colonial soldiers in the First and Second World War, it's been truly uh, moving to, to hear the uh, the levels of generosity and collegiality and war warmth uh, in relation to Sonia's uh, contribution, not only to the volume, but her wonderful uh, contribution uh, to the study of gender. Uh, it's been truly uh, moving and, and heartwarming, and particularly in the context of uh, this being a virtual conference, uh, you know, where, where, you know, human contact that we would normally uh, have in, the, in, in such uh, circumstances would, would be possible. And, it, and it, from my point of view, it's been a truly uh, heartwarming and, and uh, very heartening uh, experience to hear so much uh, warmth being expressed uh, uh, in, in such a supportive, uh, wonderful way uh, in, in today's event. But today I, I want to speak a little bit about um, the idea of the colonial soldier and particularly in relation to uh, the experience of colonial soldiers in, in the First and Second World Wars in, in relation to uh, claims uh, of citizenship. Uh, and first of all, I think it's really important to kind of understand what uh, the limitations are uh, of uh, my chapter itself, but perhaps in so do, doing point to uh, the enormous range of uh, colonial military service that really in many ways is still yet uh, to be fully explored in any great detail. And perhaps my discussion of uh, colonial soldiers in the First and Second World War has perhaps, uh, at least in recent years, uh, received uh, increasing uh, amounts of uh, attention, particularly in relation to the uh, centenary uh, of the First World War, uh, which we've uh, most of us will have been participating in in some form or other uh, in the last uh, five or six years. This has really brought renewed focus onto the experiences of uh, colonial soldiers in, in the First and Second World Wars, I would argue. But in saying this, I think it's also really important to look at the very broad range uh, of colonial uh, military service that I would argue still uh, remains uh, to be uh, explored in any great detail. And if we look at the actual concept of the colonial soldier and ask the question, what is a colonial soldier? Uh, then it covers a whole gamut, a whole range of different uh, military experiences, different uh, military uh, settings and uh, different uh, locations. And as a consequence, each of these forms of colonial uh, military service generate their own particular representations uh, of, of uh, and imaginings of, of uh, masculinity and uh, femininity. We could look, for example, as the earliest armed European uh, settlers, whether that be in North America, the Caribbean, uh, perhaps South uh, Africa or East or North Africa even, as being uh, colonial soldiers. And very quickly, uh, the, the, these colonial settlers uh, employed indigenous uh, populations as uh, either as directly as soldiers or as auxiliaries uh, from the very, very earliest days of European uh, colonization. This was a key phenomenon, even though at the same time, great fears uh, were manifested about the possibility uh, uh, and the consequences rather are of, of arming uh, local subject populations. Nevertheless, the arming of local subject populations in defense of European colonization was a key feature from the very earliest days of European settlement. 
We all can also look at the experiences of uh, colonial armed garrisons, and these would usually be men sent from the metropolitan uh, countries to form garrisons uh, in, in the colonies themselves. And often these garrisons themselves also drew on uh, mercenaries, they drew on uh, subject nation, uh, races from other uh, colonial uh, areas. In my own field of study, for example, uh, the West India Regiment, which was initially uh, raised uh, from former slaves at the time of the, of the Napoleonic Wars, um, the, the, the West India Regiment uh, eventually, as well as garrisoning uh, the, the, the British Caribbean territories, was also used extensively in uh, the uh, British conquest of, of West Africa in the Ashanti Wars in the 1870s, for example, in the hut tax war in Sierra Leone in the 1890s. So colonial soldiers become, even prior to, to the First and Second World War, highly mobile uh, military populations, as it were. And we can also look, I, I think, in the context of the First and the Second World War, uh, the settler soldiers from the white dominions of, of Canada, Australia, New Zealand uh, were often referred to uh, as colonial soldiers. And obviously, the, these uh, particular uh, militarised identities have, have received quite close attention in, in, in recent years, and particularly from the perspective of, of race and gendered uh, identities. But as I say, my, my particular chapter particularly focuses on perhaps what is the most uh, commonly recognised category of colonial soldiers, and these are non-white soldiers raised in colonised and imperial settings, particularly uh, India, Africa and the Caribbean, but also as far as the First and Second World Wars are concerned, also in East and Southeast Asia uh, for overseas service. So, as I say, the colonial soldiers as a very broad category, I think merits uh, some um, detailed uh, exploration and particularly in terms of the gendered uh, identities that emerge from the various categories of colonial uh, soldier. But to return to the, to the specific questions that, that Thomas uh, has asked us today, I think one of, one of the things that particularly uh, uh, and this particularly resonated with me when, when, when Thomas was uh, speaking about total war as being a, a phenomenon that we perhaps most readily uh, associate uh, with the first half of the 20th century in Europe. And arguably, uh, we can say that in a colonial setting, uh, total war has been a kind of ongoing experience since the earliest uh, European uh, settlement. I, I was particularly struck when Thomas was talking about how uh, gendered norms or gender roles were disrupted by uh, the, experience, the experience of the Holocaust uh, during the 30s and 40s and, and the shifting roles of men and women un, under those uh, circumstances. And this is something that we can clearly identify in, in the colonial context, in, in the eras of uh, slavery and, and uh, colonial settlement, which in many ways formed uh, the populations, particularly in the Caribbean uh, context, formed the populations from which uh, colonial soldiers would then be drawn for service overseas during the First uh, and Second World War. So I guess my, my position in, in relation to war and citizenship and, and identity in the colonial context is that in many ways the uh, sense of war as being a kind of continuum uh, and a, a kind of intersection of, of military and civil life uh, is something that's very much uh, part and parcel of, of the colonial uh, experience. And, and, and something that often happens with it within, within the colonial experience it is the uh, production of uh, both hyper-masculine identities. If we look at, for example, if we look at the slave populations of the Caribbean and the Americas, these experiences often produced 
uh, hyper-masculine identities, but at the same time, uh, also feminist, uh, feminizing effects, which apparently uh, undermined uh, men's uh, conventional uh, roles uh, uh, as breadwinners and heads of families and so forth. And at the same time, we also see in these colonial settings the, I guess, the shifting boundaries of gender as a, of a, as a category between uh, race uh, and a gender itself. The, the, the sense that many uh, colonial populations uh, and, and colonised men, for example, are regarded as uh, ineffective, uh, lacking in self-control and often over emotional in other words having many of the uh, characteristics that were often uh, ascribed uh, to women in 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 the metropolitan uh, setting the, the, these same qualities were often ascribed uh, to men in colonial or or rather subject populations in in colonized settings and which had uh, very important uh, ramifications uh, when it came to recruiting these same men as, as uh, military uh, labour. So I think that continuum uh, between uh, colonisation and imperialism and, and warfare is particularly key in understanding uh, the involvement of uh, colonial populations uh, and the recruitment of population, uh, colonial populations into the total uh, warfare of uh, the 20th century, uh, particularly. The division between peace and war, as, I, as I've suggested, is far less clear cut in, in a colonial setting. And even uh, colonial uh, military forces themselves, even in times of peace, are often presented, if you, if you look at official uh, discussions around uh, colonial garrisons, for example, they're often in times of peace uh, represented themselves as a, as a threat to internal order when they're not actively engaged on, on su the suppression of local populations. So really there's a sense of continual flux and, and, and a sense of war as a continuum uh, in, in, in the colonial and imperial setting that in many ways is merely extended when it comes to the total war of, of the 20th uh, century. I, th I think an another thing that's really key, and, and I, I think this really touches on uh, some of the work that uh, Sonia has undertaken in, in relation to her studies of uh, citizenship and particularly the kind of ideas around citizenship that emerged, for example, in, in the First and Second World War. There's a sense that warfare provides a whole set of new opportunities uh, for both men and women that then simultaneously uh, need uh, to be regulated uh, and policed. Uh, and indeed, a new kind of moral uh, citizenship starts to emerge in order to uh, regulate uh, the behavior of both men and women as they take advantage of the new opportunities that are provided to them in the uh, circumstances of modern war. And I think, again, in a colonial setting, this policing of behaviour, and particularly around uh, interactions uh, uh, around race and, uh, and gender and, and so forth, this policing of behaviour becomes particularly important throughout the colonial experience because the colonies themselves, for many people, provided uh, an escape from the straitjacket of metropolitan society. There's many, many examples of people leaving Britain uh, to work and live and work in the colonies uh, to take advantage of, of, of greater social uh, relaxation and, and the ability to live lifestyles that were perhaps not possible uh, within a metropolitan uh, setting. And in some ways, this produced its own set of anxieties in the colonies themselves, particularly interactions between uh, for example, men of colour uh, and white women and, and vice versa. These kind of interactions were uh, hugely regulated and indeed 
when it comes to the total war of, of, of the 20th uh, century, the, these interactions were regulated even more once uh, colonial soldiers start to arrive for military service uh, in Europe uh, itself. Thank you. Thank you for this opportunity. And I'm honored to participate in this seminar and to have worked with many colleagues whose vibrant and important scholarship uh, contributes to the handbook uh, to also be here today to honor Sonia and her uh, powerful uh, and generous legacy to us. In this very brief time that I have, I'd like to respond to these questions and I look forward to questions and discussions as well. My focus on the uh, North American home front, the United States and Canada in World Wars I and II, uh, and II is about citizenship in the imperialist, expansionist, industrializing nations of Canada and the United States. And citizenship was profoundly gendered and it was also a fluid contested category of identity. And in addition to the foundational frameworks that Sonia provides, I also wish to uh, give particular mention to uh, the work of Linda Kerber and her model of civic rights and also obligations and Alice Kessler Harris's vital concept of economic citizenship in the pursuit of equity as really informing uh, the questions and analysis that I've tried to pose. <clears throat> Diverse groups of Americans and Canadians experienced a paradox in the war years and their aftermaths. In the age of industrialized total war, states needed their labor, their support, their sacrifice, their service, and because of this, wartime brought new opportunities for a more complete citizenship for those who supported the nation at war, but it also brought imperatives for loyalty and national order that resulted in severe restrictions on civil liberties and citizenship in the name of national security at the expense of diversity, at the ex expense of dissent. Violence against those deemed disloyal enemies and large scale red scares, nativism, anti Semitism, and other forms of discrimination were part of the home front experiences of both conflicts and Canada, in Canada and the United States. It's also vital to understand that the apparatus of surveillance uh, really uh, expanded over citizens and non citizens dramatically during both conflicts. During each war, the home front labor of women and men for munitions conservation of resources and civilian funding of the wars by purchasing bonds and making charitable contributions was essential for victory. Policymakers and propagandists defined and militarized home front wage work and volunteerism as the equivalent to military service. As scholars build more research into the varied experiences of Canadians and Americans in these home front conflicts, with gender, race, and class in mind, we see magnified the Higgins double helix of gains and backlash. In the First World War, Jewish women, Black women, Japanese American, Native women, uh, and Latinas engaged in Red Cross work and other voluntary war work and contributed from their own organizations with publicity and praise from policymakers for their service. Indigenous women in Canada established the Six Nations Women's Patriotic League to support the war effort. In Canada and the United States, during both conflicts, women nurses and physicians sought home front and military service as a way to enlarge their civic credentials, but also as a way to expand their economic citizenship and professionalism. The First World War opened munitions factories and increased women's work as telephone operators and in railroad shops. Latinas, black women, Filipinas, and a small number of Chinese American women worked in World War II aircraft factories and shipyards, but with lower wages than white women. Women of both nations struggled for equal citizenship rights long before the First World War had started. In many American states and in some Canadian provinces, women had achieved the right to vote before the conflict. Feminists in both nations used their war support 
to claim a wider female citizenship. Many contemporaries and later historians credited women's support of wartime goals with the achievement of national women's suffrage in Canada in 1918 and the ratification of the 19th Amendment in the United States in 1920. But some women saw the First World War as a violation of social justice causes in which they were engaged. Many Montreal suffragists, for example, opposed Canada's Wartime Elections Act of September 1917 that gave voting privileges to women with husbands and sons in the military because they saw it as linking female citizenship directly to militarism. Members of the US National Women's Party protested at the White House demanding the vote and were jailed. Other women, including those who were involved in the peace movement, uh, challenged their nation states with the view that war had no place in a modern industrializing society, that women suffered the violence consequences of war and should organize as citizens to oppose it. Women involved in the Socialist Party and organized labor most often viewed war as an aid to capitalist profits and imperialism that would prevent people from experiencing the full benefits of citizenship. The gendered concepts of citizenship across Canada and the US home fronts in the first and second world wars were double edged swords. By supporting the war effort, linking all actions on the home front to the stated goals of national war, individuals could affirm or expand their claims for a more complete citizenship. Canadians and Americans of color, women and immigrants who conformed to binary masculine and feminine ideals of civic status could find some rewards and some progress on the path to citizenship. But those who did not conform faced the erosion or denial of their citizenship rights. Across the two conflicts, Canada and the United States sharpened definitions of aliens as anti-citizens and placed alienage into law and custom in new ways. And in the First World War, both governments established frustration and surveillance for non-citizens enemies and incarcerated some with that status. This prepared the way for the incarceration of Japanese Americans and Japanese Canadians during the Second World War, many of whom were citizens and the increased surveillance of and curfews for Italian and German Americans and Canadians. Following both conflicts, the US government deported suspected radicals and denied thousands the possibility of naturalized citizenship, particularly those who had chosen not to be combatants or who had worked for international peace. Queer people after both conflicts were also targets of campaigns to deny citizenship or naturalization rights, even rights to cross national boundaries or to obtain employment. Race riots targeting soldiers of color and their families in major American cities like Chicago and St. Louis after the First World War and the Zoot Suit riots in East Los Angeles targeting Mexican Americans benefiting from Second World War defense work challenged the cultural and legal citizenship of members of communities of color at the same time that such violence galvanized campaigns for social justice. In the United States, calls for restrictive legislation for immigration and naturalization followed both world wars, including the category of gender identity and sexuality in the rules. Following each, national, each conflict, national leaders proclaimed a selected extended emergency, justifying deportations and actions against dissenters and residents, citizens of color and recent immigrants in the name of national security. But they curtailed the wartime civic and economic gains for women in war work, for example, which had been established as an emergency measure for the duration of the war only. Yet, Across each conflict, Americans and Canadians also forged a citizenship of dissent. For many, the First and Second World Wars raised important questions regarding citizenship status and civil rights and civil liberties. Could citizens oppose their nation's participation in an armed conflict without being disloyal or unpatriotic, discarding the very tools by which their nations told them citizenship was to be maintained? Was there another vision of citizenship that created a place for dissent and challenged the gendered prescriptions on which civic status was based? Transnational activists who embraced a concept of citizenship over and above the nation state 
and people of color who navigated the wars and post-war years by linking colonial struggles and race relations on a global scale also challenged gendered and racialized practices of citizenship with alternative models. Thank you for your time and I appreciate it. Thank you very much to all four speakers on this round table. And it's now time to open the floor for discussion. Before we do this, I would like to point to the way we suggest to proceed. Uh, participants who want to pose a question or want to make a comment are kindly asked to notify us by typing their name and at least the word question comment in the chat function. So we are looking only at the chat function. This allows us to go in the order, most of the time in the order of the people who want to talk. And then secondly, participants are asked to, if they want to uh, say something, to uh, start their mic and unmute it afterwards and introduce themselves with their name, affiliation and discipline, if they have any. We feel that this is particularly important in the online world today because it allows transparency and interdisciplinarity, makes interdisciplinarity visible. So uh, with no wait, I already have two questions or one question. And what I would do is I would try when we get more questions to bundle them and then give the round table participants and also others the possibility to respond. Uh, Mike Goodman, do you want to ask your question yourself then? Yeah, I had two brief questions. The first one was, why were British soldiers denied the right to vote until 1918? And then I also made the point that I think that many French-speaking Canadians were opposed to conscription during both of the uh, world wars. Thank you. Stefan, yes, please. Yes, the, the, the question about why soldiers were, were denied the vote. Um, I think that there are two reasons. One of them, one of them is that they were considered to be autonomous, and autonomy was considered to be a crucial characteristic of citizens who, would, who had to be able to exert autonomous political judgment. And secondly, and that's something that Sonia Rose points to in that essay that I refer to, uh, was that citizenship was connected to very stringent residi residency requirements. So residency, uh, the fact that one rented or owned a house was considered to be an indication of the qualities that you needed for citizenship. And of course, soldiers who lived in barracks uh, couldn't meet these residency requirements. Uh, so it was residency as a sort of uh, indicator of the qualities of citizenship in particular that um, excluded soldiers from, uh, from citizenship, from political citizenship. Well, I, I was just going to say, uh, uh, Stefan's quite right in terms of the, 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 the voting qualifications in the lead up to the First World War were, were based around property ownership, uh, whether you were a householder or, uh, and also if you were a business owner, if you were a business owner, you actually had more than one vote. So in a local election, you, you could vote both as an individual and as a, as a business owner. And obviously that precluded most working, many working class people who weren't householders and obviously soldiers in barracks would be in, in, in that particular category as well. And it's worth uh, mentioning that in the context of the right to vote in the UK, I think it wasn't until 1949 with the representation of the People Act introduced by the Labour government that all um, all uh, kind of idiosyncrasies in, in the, in, in the uh, voting legislation, which still excluded certain groups of people. It wasn't until from 1949 that these were finally uh, ironed out. Uh, in, in the colonial context, it's, it's worth bearing in mind that obviously the, the, the right to vote and the act of having performed military service was a powerful uh, kind of demand uh, in the in the in the wake of uh, of demobilization and in the Caribbean context, uh, veterans uh, who had served in the British West Indies Regiment, black, black veterans, were actually entitled to vote for just one election after the war, and after that, the uh, franchise returned to its old format of being based on uh, property uh, ownership uh, and land ownership. 
And so that, that, that's an interesting little aside in the colonial context where uh, ex-servicemen were given the right to vote just in the single election that took place immediately after the war. And of course, in Britain, the, war, the elections were actually suspended uh, between 1914 and 1918 anyway. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, I have several kind of questions now, but I think we give Kimberly the chance to answer to the second question by uh, uh, Mike Goodman, and then we uh, bring the other people in, and then you know the panel has a chance to respond again. Kimberly, please. Uh, yes, certainly, Mike. Thank you, and of course, yes, uh, many opponents to conscription, and um, I appreciate your adding that in the brief. Uh, overview that I made. I wasn't able to address all of those things, but I do just want to point out a couple things. One, uh, conscription was also a tool for additional surveillance uh, and conscription also uh, with the militarization of home front work, uh, Canada had a fight or pay uh, so that uh, men were supposed to contribute to the welfare of others' families. There were uh, strict rules on, on which families and, and well-behaved women could receive that. And also in the United States, work or fight, uh, which was used to um, really control the labor of uh, many men of color uh, to require uh, work and to police that. So I think the opposition to conscription was also uh, part of uh, some of these larger processes as well. Thank you, Mike, for that comment. Thank you very much. I have now Alison Fell, Nika Wello, and Mark, uh, Mark Valenta on, uh, who want to ask questions. Uh, I suggest we simply ask them all to make their comments and questions and then we see you know, how we respond. Uh, Alison Fell, please. Well, I wanted to say thank you to start with. I've really enjoyed it. Um, it's been wonderful and a wonderful tribute. I just wondered if the panelists could say something about the importance of the periods of demobilization as well as mobilization in relation to evolving understandings of gender and citizenship. You know, thinking about more conflictual relationships with the state caused by demobilizations and the importance of veteran voices, that kind of thing. Thank you. Thank you, Alison. The next is Nika Vello. I'm a professor of comparative uh, politics and, and gender studies. So for me, this has been very, very interesting. So thank you. But I'm always looking forward. So now there's the big, big handbook. But my question is, can I ask the panel what they think are the most pressing or crucial issues that need further research in the coming years? Thank you very much for this question. That's a little light for us to answer. And the next is uh, Mark Valenta. Marka Valenta, sorry. Hi there, good evening. Thank you very, very much for these uh, talks. Uh, so my name is Marka Valenta. Uh, I'm based at Utrecht University in the Netherlands uh, and I'm an interdisciplinary scholar at the intersection of politics, anthropology and history. Um, and the question that I have has to do with uh, wartime sexual violence. Um, and particularly there's, there's research that's now starting to come out, I think in recent years about uh, sexual violence by men against other men in the context of war. And uh, so I have, I have conceptual questions about, you know, how does this shape discussions about masculinity and citizenship uh, when we, we think about it through that lens. Uh, and then I also have very practical questions about, for example, how far back historically can we trace that? Like, where do we find the first sort of historical tracings of this? Um, and I also have a question about, are there any kinds of uh, discussions or traces of women's sexual violence in the context of war? Um, uh, yeah, so those are my questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. This uh three very big fields to respond. The first was the question of, I tried to make it short, demobilization, gender and citizenship. The second question was the issue of what do we all feel are the future fields of research? And the third was war and sexual violence. My suggestion is that we start with demobilization, gender and citizenship, citizenship, then talk about war and sexuality, and at the end, everybody gives an answer to the future research. Uh, so who wants to talk about demobilization, gender, and citizenship? Or should I do this myself because I've written the chapter on this issue? 
Okay, I will give it a try. Uh, what we really, so demobilization, and I hope the others will come in, demobilization, gender and citizenship is a really important subject because what we really try to show in the handbook is really to blur the borders of war and peace and really look in a consequent way at the aftermath of war. And of course, this is also relevant for the discussion, extremely relevant for the discussion of citizenship. And I explored it in the handbook for the first and second world war, so for the interwar period at the, po the long post war after 1945. And what you can really see is that war mobilization and propaganda really uses in the 20th century, this rhetoric for citizenship and the promises in some ways to bring people into, you know, mobilizing, supporting the war and the needed work in war or the needed support in the military. But what happened in respect, especially of women, but I think the same thing happens actually interestingly with colonial soldiers and colonial subjects is that of course, after the war, you know, a lot of disclaims and that's a pattern which you can see again and again also in e earlier wars, uh, the, the promises are forgotten. They are not really taken seriously by the political leaders. So you see, if you look at, uh, look at the women that in I think eight or nine countries of, uh, you know, women got the right to vote after the first world war, but in a lot of other countries, including, you know, France, for example, you know, it took until the second world war or even much later that you know, women got the right to vote, even so they were very actively in large numbers supporting the war effort. And the same really cause, and I would like to bring in Richard here, is really if you, the same thing happened if you look at the colonies that you know, the, they needed the support of colonial subjects, colonial soldiers in the first and second world war. They made claim, they made promises, but then after the war, if, if for example, think about the way the Versailles Treaty is dealing with the former colonies or colon, colonies of Germ the German Empire or the Ottoman Empire. You know they are now under the League of Nations mandate and really increase the colonial territory of Britain and France. And the people, the men and women who supported the war, really have no different status in their citizenship, right? Which is really triggering in the interwar period an increase of anti-colonialism. So Richard, do you want to talk a little bit more about this perhaps? Yeah, I mean, what, one of the things that interests me, I, 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 I struggle with this idea that, how can I say, colonial subjects enlisted on, on a certain understanding, because I think colonial subjects enlisted for the First and Second World War for a huge variety of reasons and in many contexts, they weren't at that moment particularly politicized. I don't think they consciously thought, for example, if I fight for the British Empire, that when I return, I will uh, receive certain rights. So I think this is something that gradually develops over time, and particularly during the course of the war, in relation to their encounters with um, uh, military discipline, the experience of discrimination and their interactions with uh, political ideas from, you know, a wide range of different groups of colonial soldiers. And I think it's no accident, for example, that Pan-African ideas gather pace during the First World War due to the interactions between African-American troops and colonial soldiers from uh, Africa uh, and, and the Caribbean, for example. So I think there's a gradual developing uh, political understanding that on at the time of demobilization starts to build a series of concrete demands. Uh, one of those would be, you know, the right to vote. But equally, you know, citizenship has to be seen in its much broader context of being about you know, social and economic emancipation and, and, and a decent uh, decent level of welfare in these colonial societies, which by their very nature, they were unable uh, to deliver. So it's very quick. Quickly, the demobilised soldiers themselves start to be regarded as something of a social problem. 
and in the context of the Caribbean, soldiers returning to the Caribbean territories were very quickly dispersed to other islands with work permits where they could be guaranteed better chances of employment. So large numbers of Jamaicans, for example, uh, immediately uh, on their uh, arrival in Jamaica, re-embarked uh, and went to work in Cuba uh, up until the mid 20s and 30s. It wasn't until the, the effects of the depression were felt in Cuba that some of these veterans then returned to Jamaica and became far more politically active and were involved in the labor unrest in the 1930s, uh, which in itself precipitated um, the uh, granting of the, of the franchise in 1944. So it's quite a lengthy and, and, and involved uh, process, but I think the demobilization period is when all the frustrations start to come to a head and it's at this point when people are starting to say, well, I've done my bit for the empire and what kind of world am I going to return to? What kind of island territory? What kind of, you know, uh, you know, what's life going to be life, like on my return to India and so forth? It's when these questions become really uh, focused, I think. And I think the same you could say for North America, right? If you think about the African men and women who participate in the first and second world war, and especially the rise of uh, the important role of veterans, Afro-American mm -hmm. veterans in the uh, uh, civil rights movement after the second world war. I have to look a little bit after the time. Uh, 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 everybody will have a chance at the end, I suggest to respond to this future of the research question. I just think that's a very fine way of closing this panel. But before we have the question of war and sexual violence, and nobody on our panel has written any of the two chapters, you know, one by Regina Mühlbach on the First and Second World War and one by Dubravka Sarko on the conceptualization of sexual violence. But uh, is anybody wanting to give it a give, give, yeah, Stefan, please. Yeah, thanks, Marka, for, for that question. Um, there is, as, as you rightly pointed out, the research is beginning to emerge of this, on this topic on, on sexual violence in wartime context uh, by men against um, other men. Um, and what is becoming increasingly clear as this, as this research emerges is that in terms of the meanings of that violence, uh, that meaning is to use that horribly overused word, overdetermined. There are so many, many meanings attached to them and some of them are those of citizenship, but perhaps more importantly, these are meanings connected to collective identities, to belonging or not belonging to a nation, uh, to differentiations in terms of Western and non-Western, and some of these cases where this uh, violence, sexual violence of men against men have become most visible as for instance in the Abu Ghraib um, uh, uh, scandal uh, were quite clearly um, uh, problematic from a Western point of view because they upset hierarchies in terms of civilization between Western and non-Western. So it were these sort of collective meanings that were clearly at stake there. In terms of um, how far we can go back in history, I'm not sure. In our in this handbook, I think the earliest cases of sexual violence of men against men that we point to are in World War II. I think uh, probably they also exist for World War One. I'm quite sure they exist for World War One, but beyond that, I'm I'm not sure. Perhaps Thomas uh, knows, but I'm, I'm not sure. I don't think that we at this point have gone further than World War One. No, but that's the general problem in the research on sexual violence, that it's much, much better explored and researched for the 20th century. Even if we look at the first half of the 19th century, for example, the uh, French Revolutionary and Napoleonic Wars, there is very little search, uh, research on this. And one of the issues is really the issue of how, what kind of sources can we use? You know, so we have a, a lot of rhetoric about the misuse, the rape of women, the rape of the nation earlier, but there are, we find very little in the primary sources about actual rape beyond the articles of 
a, a war, for example. So it is really an issue. And I, that leads me to the last big question to everybody. This is really one of the big gaps of research, sexual violence against men and women, not only for the 20th century, not only in a comparative perspective, but really also for the earlier periods. And we need to give this more attention and we need to be really become creative with the kind of what kind of sources can we use to explore this. There is one volume edited by Elizabeth Heinemann who tried to get, you know, address this in a long-term historical perspective, this subject, and it's a great start. But I had a conversation with her. There are a lot of gaps which we still cannot respond to. One is, what is one of the better aspects is uh, sexual violence in the context of colonial warfare. Angela Vellicott has written an excellent, uh, she's an Australian historian. That's why she is not here because the time difference is too big, but she has written a great chapter on this subject, colonial warfare, gender and sexual violence in the handbook. So I would like to suggest that we end this panel with everybody talking about this big question, what are the crucial gaps of research he or she would like to see addressed more in the, uh, in the context you know, of the future research on gender, military, and war? And let me start. I would make a claim for the early modern period and the 19th century. For as an editor, it was so unbelievably difficult sometimes to find authors on subjects which we envisioned as important, including, for example, something like the gendered history of the wars of unification in the 19th century. You would have thought that would be a subject which is well explored. It is not. There are some articles, but there is not really. So one of the big gaps is the earlier we come in time, the more research we definitely need on all fronts. So I turn over in chronological order. I did my plea for the early modern period and the 19th century to Stefan Duding. And I think we go in chronological order and Thomas Kühne will have the last word then. Okay, Stefan, please. Well, one thing I, I pointed to in, in my talk is that, that I think we need to understand more um, about these, this, this enormous uh, contradiction between this myth of wars being man business and the fact that most men actually do not fight and that actually most men in, um, in, in uh, the modern military, but also early, earlier militaries are not in positions of combat, but are simply typing or are in charge of logistics. Um, so I think there's much more to understand uh, there in terms of uh, the way that men are involved in war and the way that they are not involved in war uh, and the, the, the tension between this actual involvement of men in, in war and the myth of men fighting. The second thing that I think that I found very interesting as we were doing this, this uh, volume is that we need to understand more about war and gender, let's say after total war and after the paradigm of total war. For a long time, we've thought about the history of war in particular in the 19th and 20th century in terms of total war. We also do this partly in the handbook, um, but as um, uh, uh, discussions around um, new wars, for instance, this very problematic concept of new wars make clear there is a lot of space here for rethinking war and gender after uh, total war. So that is something that I think would be very interesting. And also from a historical perspective, because many of the aspects of war as we experience it now would be very familiar to people in the early modern period. That was the reason why historians was, were so critical in respect of the concept of new wars, right? Uh, and we discussed this in our introduction of the first part on the global Cold War and the wars of globalization intensively. Richard, do you want to follow up? What are for you the, the largest gaps in research which you would like to see to be addressed? I was gonna say, certainly from the colonial perspective, I think the emphasis has hugely been on, on uh, masculinity and military service and, uh, and, and the experience of colonial soldiers. And I think there's a huge gap to be filled in relation to the role of 
women in, in colonial settings, and particularly in, in the context of if we see war as a continuum, and, and particularly in the colonial context of, you know, colonial production feeding into uh, the war effort and producing the materials of war, for example, uh, much more focus on, on, on women's experiences in colonial settings and, and their involvement in wartime production particularly. There is a, a, a small emerging literature. There's a, in, in the Jamaican context, uh, Dahlia Bean has written a, a book on the experiences of Jamaican women in the First and Second World Wars, but it's a, a, a relatively small literature at the present time. And I, I think that would really open up you know, space for fruitful discussion, uh, uh, particularly around this idea of, you know, the limits that we impose on ourselves if we just think in terms of frontline military service, which, uh, you know, significantly overdetermines the discussions around citizenship at the present time, and particularly so in the colonial uh, context. Thank you. Uh, Susan, I would like to bring you in because you were not only... <laughs> You know Sonia and a close friend, but also one of the authors, you have written a chapter on uh, the home fronts, the so-called home fronts, you know, during the First and Second World War in Europe in a comparative perspective. So I think these are great suggestions. I would just encourage a couple of methodological ones. I think there's room for new work on the materiality of war that I think uh, has been really informative on, on the emotional history of war and really back to the question of sexual violence on thinking about silences um, and how we can learn from other uh, disciplines and, and other time periods about what we do uh, with the absence as well as the presence of evidence. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. And Kimberly, uh, Jensen, now it's your turn. What do you imagine, what do you want to see more addressed? I um, wanted to uh, suggest that we can consider uh, opening sources, new sources, and rereading particular sources, because if we think about the home front, uh, in particular in the US and Canada, um, how can we find the sources? Uh, Sue's important point, there are so many gaps in what we know. Um, one of the things that's happening in the US and Canada is the um, funding for digitization of historic newspapers. And these can provide uh, a lot of information about uh, everyday life, about uh, communities, and especially uh, people in non-dominant communities. And women are uh, there through the pages. So I think those are important sources. I also think that there's really a lot of hidden materials in uh, the investigative and surveillance reports that were designed to um, supply the state with information. And we have to be very careful, obviously, about using surveillance uh, tools. But as historians, I think uh, we can rethink the way that we use sources to, uh, and use these uh, emerging sources particularly, to uh, ask these questions and to gain the voices of those who haven't been represented. Thank you very much. And last but not least, Thomas Kühne. Thomas, please. Thank you. So as a historian of modern Germany, of modern Europe and of the Holocaust, I will say that I think the biggest challenge, the biggest gap is in a field on which I have limited expertise and that is non-European warfare, <coughs> uh, colonial warfare, but not only colonial, but I mean, more largely non-European, non-Western. Uh, warfare. <clears throat> I think that is a field that uh, we know least about. And I think if we did study that much more deliberately than we do, um, we would not only learn something about, I mean, in empirical terms about how war and uh, gender citizenship or whatever um, played out in, in non-Western Western, uh, regions of the world, we might even be challenged in a different way in, in that we would learn that our concepts, <clears throat> citizenship, even war, and maybe even gender, look differently, maybe not completely differently, but I mean somewhat differently, if we included more deliberately, as I want to say, non-European perspectives. 
Okay, thank you, Thomas, for your comment. Uh, I don't really try to attempt a summary, but I would like to, at the end, emphasize five trends. So I really, as I said at the beginning, we need research on earlier periods. We need much more research, and I cannot underline this enough, on non-Western conflicts, non-Western militaries, non-Western styles of warfare over the periods from a gender perspective. There is some work which came out in, you know, in the last two decades, but we need more. And in the same token, and I'm astonished, uh, Thomas, because we talked about this, what we also really need is more research and on war and genocide and gender. You know, this is one of the largest gaps which breaks my heart that we really didn't find someone who was willing to compare the different genocides in the 20th century and warfare from a gender perspective. This is really a big gap in the book, but it's also a gap of research. It's so focused on Holocaust or on individual genocides when they apply a gender perspective. What we need is comparison. And that's really what I would like to emphasize as the next point. We need much more temporal and regional comparison. You know, uh, gender historians, and I was one of them for a long time, really we focus on our national cases because we know them. We can go into deep research, do look on de in detail on things. But we, I think the state of research allows us now to go broad to try to compare, to relate, you know, even if this makes us sometimes feel comfort uncomfortable, you know, and we do have to make generalizations, which we want to avoid, we try to avoid because we don't want to recreate new master narratives. And the last point is something which uh, I found interesting in the work on the post-1945 period is, we have plenty on research, of research on the American military and the integration of women and the re reluctance of integrating women into combat, integrating gay and lesbian soldier. We have some research on Britain, but we have astonishingly little in the historical perspective, you know, on the integration of women in the other Western and Eastern militaries. We have more research of into the inclusion or exclusion of women in anti-colonial movements, interestingly. But I think we could do much better in the post-1945 period and really look at uh, the history of the inclusion of women and gay and lesbian soldiers in a more broader perspective. And this would be really, I think, very interesting for our contributions to the current debate about women and gay and lesbians and transgender people in the military too. Because the historical per perspective challenges, uh, challenges us and challenges hopefully our readers and our listeners and our students to uh, question some of the still given assumptions about the gender order of military and war. And that's the last word which I would like <laughs> like to do here. I hope this was an interesting panel. I hope we did justice to Sonia Rose's important contribution to the scholarship and to the handbook. And so allow me to thank everybody on the panel, everybody, uh, again, uh, all the authors and everybody involved in this project on our long ride. Uh, thank you to all of you. Uh, I greatly appreciate the collaboration we all did together. Everybody have a nice fr Friday afternoon or Friday evening. Thank you again and all the best. Stay healthy in this crazy times. <laughs>